Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is in the book of Genesis, the first three chapters, Genesis, first three verses, Genesis chapter one, verses one to three. The word of our God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then our gospel lesson from the gospel of John chapter one, beginning in verse one. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being which came into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, bless these readings from his word. So once again, come before our Lord and God in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus the Christ, your Son, who was from the beginning, and who is and shall be forevermore. We pray, O Lord, that we might, knowing him, have life with him forevermore. Cause the name of your Son to be glorified in our midst, O Lord. Cause the name of your Son to be lifted up in the world, O Lord. And we pray and long for that time, O Lord, when every enemy will be placed under his feet forevermore. For that time when he will turn the kingdom over to you. Work in us, O Lord, that we might become more like him. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody uh, here go to light up night on the diamond in Ligonier? Anybody do that? I actually do that. I kind of think it's fun. I had to miss it this time because I was in, of all places, Bald Eagle watching a football game. Uh, I have often thought, though, about what Pittsburgh did for a while with their light-up night. And they began to call it sparkle season. Now, I think they've dropped that, and I'm glad they dropped that. They're still not doing that. Does anybody hear them talking about it being sparkle season anymore? But they did that. And you know why they did that? Because they didn't want to offend anybody by somehow attaching the name of the Christ 
to the holiday. Because you realize that we are headed into the Christmas season. That season when we celebrate the birth of the Christ. It's fascinating to me that the culture that we live in has adopted this holiday. Uh, it, it, one of the things that often has been taught, even in churches, you know, that, that somehow Christianity accommodated a pagan holiday and Christianized it. Christmas. I think uh, Jack has done a wonderful job. In fact, I might want to encourage him to reproduce his paper and put it back out in the vestibule for you, wherever you are, Jack, in regard to the birth of Christ and when it actually took place. You know, in the church down through the centuries, right from the beginning, celebrated this time of year as the birth of Christ. It was not the accommodation of a pagan holiday Christianized, but a recognition of when Jesus was born. Jack did a marvelous job of demonstrating that from the scriptures. And you can demonstrate it from history as well. But what's happening now in our culture is they've taken a Christian holiday, the celebration that Believers ought to have as we rejoice over the birth of the one that was promised way back in the garden. The one that would crush the serpent's head. The one that Isaiah described so ably. The one who would come from the Father. The one who would come through the line of promise, the one who would sit on David's throne forevermore, the one who would be not only king but our great high priest, the one who would come and fulfill all that the Old Testament prefigured, all that the law of Moses prefigured. As we look at the tabernacle, the one who would fulfill the tabernacle, who would fulfill the high priest, who would fulfill all those sacrifices and do what they described. Do what they drew a picture of. The one who would actually come and shed not the blood of bulls and goats that could never take away sin, but would lay down his own life and shed his own blood and redeem you from your sin. Wash you clean and not only redeem you, but he would clothe you in his righteousness. And so 2 Corinthians, he made him who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. To be sin in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin, paid the debt in full, so it's gone. There's nothing left for you to pay. It's gone. And you have peace with God. And then he clothes you in his righteousness. So that you are prepared and ready to stand faultless before the throne with exceeding great joy. That bride of Christ is washed clean and clothed in his glory, ready to spend eternity with our Lord. He does that so that you would be children of God and joint heirs with himself. And so in the Beatitudes, he talks about the meek inheriting the earth. You are going to share in all that. It's yours. So stop and think about what we have. You have peace with God. 
You are forgiven your sins. Wash clean. You are clothed in His righteousness. You have a glorious future that none can take away. An inheritance that can never be touched. 1 Peter 1. That's yours. Is it any wonder that Christians down through the centuries celebrated the birth of the Redeemer? Now we're in what they call the Advent season as we anticipate that day. Build up to it. And we ought to celebrate it. And celebrate Christ and the forgiveness of sins and all that He is. And what our culture has done is they have accommodated the celebration and de-Christianized it. So what's it all about now? Well, if you pay attention to some of the newspaper articles lately and in regard to the recent elections, one of the comments that I heard was, it's still all about the economy, stupid. So what's it about? The economy. Now, I have no problem with exchanging gifts on Christmas Day. I think it's a wonderful practice. But that's not what it's all about. And I love family gatherings. That's good. In fact, we have traditions in our family that I just love. I love to get up and uh, anticipate the gifts. We have a big breakfast. And we read the account of the Lord's birth together. And we share in the joy of that birth. And we eat a big breakfast that I love. And we have other food that we set out all day. And I really enjoy that too. It's a great time with the family. And we have fun with the presents and it's good. But it's not all about the trappings It's all about the event, the birth of the Savior. And if you remove Christ from the event, then it's nothing more than a hollow exchange of gifts purchased in order to bolster the economy. Don't let them rob you of the joy of the birth of Christ. Don't get lost in what the culture has done. Let's remember what it's all about in these coming weeks. And today I want you to consider even just the very first few verses of the Gospel of John as we begin our journey through this fourth Gospel. The one that was the last to be written. The one that's different than the other ones. It really is written to us in a unique way. And I hope you were listening as Jack read to you this morning. Did you notice the two texts? Genesis 1. How does it begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How about John? How does it begin? Look at our text today. In the beginning was the word And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Do you notice the similarity? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And the earth was void and without form. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. John is intentionally going back to Genesis 1. What do we learn from it? Well, first of all, what we see here is this business about the Word. Now, what's the Word? What's the Word? You have to notice the language here. I want you to listen again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born <coughs> not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. For of, the full, of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus. Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. What's the word? It's not some force. It's not reason. It's not just a power. The word is is a person, a being. You can't miss it, can you? It's there in the language. And the word is named. So what do we learn about the word? First of all, he was always with the Father. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I know the Jehovah Witnesses try to turn this around and make it a God, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, particularly here, because you all have heard this over and over, and Jack has done a great job of demonstrating it from the original language. This is how it should read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God! You can't miss it. It's putting exclamation points on. The language is there and the design of the grammar is there to emphasize the fact that the, what John is speaking of, the one who is called the Word, is God. And as you read through the rest of the text, you can't miss it. He's God. He's God. What else do you learn? All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, in Genesis 1, you really get a picture of the Trinity. 
And the Spirit's moving there. And God is moving there. Every member of the Trinity has his part in creation. Yes, the Father directs it. But who actually brings things into being? In Colossians it tells us. The book of Hebrews tells us. And John 1 tells us that it was the Son, the second person of the Trinity that said, let there be light. And there was light. Nothing came into being that has come into being unless he did it. To this one who is called the Word, who is with the Father, with God, the one who is the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is the acting agent in creation. You see it? It's kind of hard to miss it, isn't it? All things came to, into being through him, and apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. I'm going to focus on that next week. This week, I want you to see who the Word is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but has everlasting life. And John bore witness of him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a rank higher than I. For he existed before me for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus the Christ, the one who reveals the Father to us. You see, John names him. The Word come in the flesh. Is Jesus whose birth we celebrate. He is the one who brought about, who realized all that Moses described in the law. Jesus the Christ. Of the Father's love begotten. We just sang that, that very, very, very old hymn. It goes way back. Do you realize that Christians have been singing that for centuries? I hope you listen to the words because it described the Son of God, the one who was from the beginning who was with the Father. Paul understood this. Philippians chapter 2. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, you've got to understand what that means. Who, although he was God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself. And taking, and 
the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He's God. The name Yahweh is attached to him. And yet, think of the love of the Father. From before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 tells us that he loved you. And how much did he love you? He loved you enough to send his only begotten son to redeem you, his adopted sons and daughters. He loved you enough to send his beloved son, his begotten son, the one who was with him always, the one who spoke the worlds into existence. He sent him to become one with you. And this same son of God took a human nature to himself, a real human nature, He really became a man. So, he is God, very God. And he is man, very man. And as a man, he lived under the law perfectly, enduring all that you endure in order to redeem you. And he shed his blood for you so that you might be forgiven. And realize this, you who are believing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting what he did for you, not what you can do yourself. It's not your acts of religion. It's not your taking of baptism or partaking of baptism or the Lord's Supper. It's not your good works. It's none of that. It's what Christ did for you that saves you. And when he saves... He saves to the uttermost. So you don't pay for your sins at all. He paid for it completely. So you really are washed clean and your salvation really is certain and he really does present you faultless before the throne. He really does. The Father loved you enough to send his son to the cross where he would bear the Father's wrath for you. Astounding. How can he love you that much? How can he love me that much? I have no answer to that. All I have is his word. Believe the word of God. He is utterly trustworthy. And how about the son? You know, it's not like he enjoyed the cross. Do you realize what he was facing? He realized it, and it was enough that it caused him to sweat blood when he considered it. And he prayed, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And yet it says, for the joy put before him, he endured that, the cross. Why? Because God the Father is glorified by that, and because you are saved by that. And you will be glorified through that. And you will be with him forever. This is good news. Do you realize that when the Lord is finished with the work that he's begun in you, you are not going to leave this world and go to purgatory where you pay for your sins. That is, and I... That's nonsense. It's just nowhere in Scripture. Who pays for your sins? Not you. Jesus did. And it's not you who earns it, because if it's you who earns it, you could never be certain of it. Well, actually, you could. You could be certain that you'd never get it. 
But because it's Jesus who pays for your sins, you can be certain of it, that they're really paid for, and you're really redeemed. And you really are children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. Brothers and sisters, we are approaching the Christmas season. Don't let the hubbub of the culture rob you of the joy of the season. Don't love, let the insistent playing of insipid Christmas songs constantly on the radio ruin it for you. Don't let the stress of buying just the right presents destroy it. Remember what it's all about. It's all about Jesus who died for you. All about Jesus who was born for you. All about Jesus who lived for you. All about Jesus who was raised for you. All about Jesus who reigns for you. And rejoice. For the Lord's King. And your redemption is sure. If you are trusting his work rather than yours. If you're trusting your own, somehow thinking that you can be good enough or that you can earn it or you're going to pay for it, you're lost. And you need to come to the Savior. And I would read again the words that I mentioned before, just one verse earlier. I want to read it in your hearing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Better go to 2 Corinthians. There we go. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, this is verse 17, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. You don't reconcile yourself to him. He reconciled us through Christ to himself. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We get to proclaim the good news, the gospel of peace with God. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You're trusting your own work, I plead with you, stop. It's worthless. Paul called it dung. Refuse. Trust Christ and his work. And that alone, for that alone, can reconcile you to the Father. And those of you who believe, celebrate Christmas. Celebrate it well. Focus on the birth of the Savior and his death and his resurrection and his reign, for it is forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good you've given us. We thank you for the love that you have demonstrated to us, that you sent the one who brought the worlds into existence to redeem us, the one who spoke the worlds into existence to live among us and be one of us, the one who would die for us and be raised again in reign on the throne of David forever. We thank you for Jesus the Christ. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the, the word of mercy, the good news, 
the gospel. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would cause that to bear fruit in our life every day and in every way. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.